Okay, hello. We are back for another episode of Alarm Nerds, and we have a very special guest today. I have Roy Pollack, champion of the industry. He's been he's been a champion of the industry for about 50 years now, the president of staysafe.net training, the former president of the Florida Alarm Association, and our resident expert on compliance and credentialing. So, Roy, thank you very much for being here today. And what we're going to be talking about is your area of expertise, which is licensing, credentialing, compliance, and why it matters for your business. So thank you very much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, so why don't we just jump right into it? So let me start with this. So when you look around the country and you look at some areas require such extensive experience and qualifications to operate, and some states don't really seem to care. Why in your opinion, do you feel that our industry is so heavily regulated in, in some areas and using, you know, you can think of whatever example you'd like, but looking at an area that is heavily regulated, like where you are in Florida or where I am in New Jersey, why does that exist? Has it always been that way? What's the need for this level of oversight? I think that uh, some of the states have evolved over many years. Uh, when I first started in the business in, in the early 70s, there was no licensing. You might have had to get a uh, occupancy or some sort of business license. Uh, New York didn't, and, I, and my first business was up in New York in the 70s. And in New York, the general law 6D didn't come about until 1992. Uh, by that time, I was in Florida. I had moved down to Florida in 1987. And that was the same year that Florida enacted their licensing law for alarm companies. And it has evolved over the course of the last 30 years, uh, making it somewhat more rigid, somewhat more relaxed. It has changed with the times. You have other states, such as yourself in New Jersey, uh, where licensing is, is very strict. There's a lot of continuing education requirements that is necessary. And then you go right across the border to Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. where there is absolutely no licensing. Uh, around the country, there's about 35 states that have some sort of licensing law. And then the remaining either have nothing or it's done on a local city or town uh, basis. So you, you go from state to state, and it's very different, uh, even across borders from New York to Connecticut to New Jersey. Was everyone just kind of freewheeling before that, that, you know, using, you know, Pennsylvania's example now, but you talked about New York in the 70s and 80s. Could you just do whatever you wanted and nobody really cared? Absolutely. There was no licensing. There was no permitting. Uh, even back then, some of the electricians didn't have the kind of laws and rules you have now. Mm -hmm. And um, we just, you know, went out, um, hung up a shingle said that we could do uh, alarm installations and you were in business. I I, uh, I think a lot of states now, like you use the example of Pennsylvania, just operate like the Wild West. I came across a company not too long ago where they were talking about installing addressable fire panels. And I said, how long have you been doing this? They said, eh, about three or four months. I said, three or four months. But how do you, what's your, you know, were you, what's your qualification? They said, well, we bring the manual with us. <laughs> I think you're going to see that that's the kind of thing where the local fire departments, the AHJs, they're going to have some issues with it. And with the changing technology that's out there today, from POTS to radio and cellular and MFEN, um, the communication paths, and it, it happens so fast now, there's no time to even get a cancellation. And so fire departments, especially are uh, running on alarm calls that they don't need to. Uh, when I was a lieutenant in the fire department, you know, we ran three o'clock in the morning to a busted frozen water pipe and, you know, or food on the stove or somebody in a school system pulling a pull station. They call back and say, it's false alarm, don't go. And that might be great in the police world, but in the fire world, mm -hmm. even today, uh, they might cancel full complement of a response, but they'll send somebody out there to verify it because uh, as it happened in, in areas in South Florida, they've canceled <laughs> alarms and found out they went back an hour later and the entire house was engulfed in flames. Mm -hmm. 
there was a um so UCC had a conference in Philadelphia a few weeks ago where they gave a statistic. I think it was, I just assume it was from parks because I assume most of the data comes from parks. Um, but they said for 2022, something like between 92 and 97% of all alarms that were dispatched were false alarms in the United States, which is insane. <laughs> well, that's the statistic that's been around for 30 years. And there have been laws that have been put into effect, such as enhanced call verification. And today there's a brand new standard out called the, the uh, uh, alarm verification score. And so there are things that the industry is doing to help reduce false alarms, but the number of false alarms will continue to be at that 98% rate because as well as the alarm companies cancel a number of alarms, the ones that they don't cancel, the ones that they can't cancel, because of various reasons, they still tend to be false dispatches. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones where you have proliferation of fines and uh, rules where it's no response so that the police are cracking down on those kind of companies. Do you have any thoughts on why some states do crack down so hard and some states are just kind of, you know, well, if you have a code book, that's good enough for us? I think they're looking at manpower. Police and fire are looking at manpower, especially fire. Um, we are looking at the issue of, you know, endangering their first responders. And it's a matter of trying to use the resources that the police and fire officials have to combat the amount of false alarms and the false runs. On the other side of the coin, people always say, well, they weren't doing anything anyway, so they might as well go to an area that they may not have been uh, patrolling as much as they would have. And that's not a great argument, but that is what is being said from those that are not involved in the false alarm reduction process. There are a lot of people who feel that a lot of the regulation is just a fundraiser. Do you do you think that holds water? I don't, because I think that with what the fees that we pay, and in Florida, it's about $300 a year for a license. <laughs> um, and some of the states are more and some of the states are a little bit less. It's really not a money-making issue for the licensing agencies. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork that you have to do. There's a lot of paperwork on their end that they have to maintain. I think it's more of trying to weed out those that don't do it right. Also having a, a history of who is out there and who is doing it. And that's why Florida has a very strict criminal background uh, law as well. So that if you have any kind of convictions, you are basically uh, unable to get a job in the security industry. Who would you say has the sharpest teeth in the country as far as enforcement? Well, that's a very tough one. I will say that I will say that Florida is very strict on their enforcement. They have a um, electrical contractors licensing board. Mm -hmm. They have attorneys, they have investigators. Um, I have personally seen at the meetings where they have uh, thrown the book at people literally and caught, you know, charged them for anywhere from a $500 fine to thousands of dollars uh, for violations. Now, New York has a very strict law. New York City fire York regulations City. is extremely strict. What the enforcement is and what the policies are on, on issuing fines I couldn't, I couldn't speak to that. But even in other states, uh, the enforcement is there. There are boards uh, that review the uh, violations. Uh, Tennessee has one. Uh, other states are not as... I've heard of Tennessee also issuing arrest warrants for people violating protocol. I mean, there, Tennessee is definitely put on the top of the list as another one of the strict states. Unfortunately, Tennessee disbanded their alarm board about a year or two ago. Oh, okay. And so now it's handled by staff personnel. So their alarm board is been, you know, is is no longer. Okay. Um, but the laws is still in effect. Texas has, you know, pretty strict rules. 
for both a fire license and a bird alarm license. Um, some states will have a bird alarm license, but not a fire alarm license and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So obviously the state, the, you know, the AHJ wants to know who's doing what and know that you, you know, if you're going to run cable, if you're going to handle life safety, that you have some benchmark of qualifications, but I think things are very different today versus a couple of years ago. So with the growth of all of these, you know, DIY, buy your, you know, build your own system on the internet and, you know, we'll just send you basic instructions. Do you think that the average customer, and there's a different argument for residential versus commercial, but do you think the average customer cares if they're using a licensed agency unless their insurance requires it? I do not. I think that the DIY customer is the kind of customer that is either going to uh, purchase the equipment at the local big box store or order it on the internet and then have some sort of arrangement for monitoring or self-monitoring today uh, where it goes to their phone, it goes to their iPad and they can make the decision on dispatching someone or going back to the premises uh, themselves. But I think that in places like, and I'll use one I'm very familiar with is Palm Beach County, Florida, uh, the alarm permit, if you're going to get an alarm dispatch in Florida, in Palm Beach, you need to have an alarm user permit. And on that permit, it's going to ask you two things. Who is your monitoring company and who was your installing company? Mm -hmm. Now, if you do it yourself, you'll put down yourself. But if somebody else is going to be monitoring, they need to also be licensed. And without having a licensed monitoring company, they're not responding. You know, I always, when I hear about that, I think about a lot of these DIY companies and without naming any names, how do they get around these licensing requirements? Because I can't imagine that all of these DIY companies are licensed. Is it just, they just slip under the radar nobody's paying enough attention? How does that work? There are ways to get around it, which I won't even go into right now. <laughs> However, I will tell you that for the most part, buying the equipment off the shelf or buying it over the counter, there's no laws on it. You can buy the equipment, uh, even some of the wholesalers or mm -hmm. distribution places. You walk in, maybe they won't give you the wholesale price, they'll give you the retail price, and you can walk out with a kit for an alarm system. You install it. If it goes to your app, that's all there is. But if it goes mm -hmm. to a monitoring station... Again, the monitoring companies have to be licensed, but not every state requires monitoring companies to be licensed, nor if you're out of state, do they require you to be licensed. Again, Florida, mm -hmm. even if you're in Ohio monitoring for a customer in Florida, that monitoring company must be licensed in Florida and have what they call a qualifier. I, I, think, I think on the residential side, I don't think it even enters the average customer's brain, whether there's a license or not. I think on the commercial side, I think it becomes an issue when they start having problems, when they start getting false alarm fines for dispatches because the system's not installed properly, or the system doesn't work, or they're getting, you know, the phone's going off all the time. But I think you're right. It's it's just so easy to just go and buy a kit and say, oh, what do I need to pay someone for? I can I can do this. A lot of a lot of the monitoring companies are licensed nationwide, wherever they have to be. Mm -hmm. uh, they no longer are, you know, handling just accounts that are in their local backyard. A lot of them are branched out from just doing their own systems and now take in dealers. The smaller alarm guy that maybe has two or three hundred accounts and they monitor for them. They do make sure, some of them at least, will make sure that that local guy is licensed in the jurisdictions where he's working, as well as they have their own qualifiers that are responsible for maintaining licenses in the jurisdictions that they are going to be monitoring. And that can be anywhere from Maine to California and Florida to Alaska. How do you end up with these with this gray area where you have these handymen that go out and install, you know, there are these pro installers you know, in quotes, where they go and they'll put in your ring cameras or they'll put in your your nest or how, how, how does that work? How is that slip under the, you know, how is that not a problem? It is a problem, but again, you're looking at something where it's a ring doorbell or some other brand of doorbell uh, or even a camera system that alerts you uh, on your phone. You're not requesting police or fire officials response through a monitoring company or through 
uh, an alarm system itself. These well, some are of them are. Them. Some of them are. Well, the, if they are, they need to be licensed. And you will find that these new versions of it, uh, of certain manufacturers that are requesting police response, <laughs> they will be fined, especially in, in a location like Florida or New Jersey. Uh, these are places where it's pretty strict. Do you, I mean, I think some of that falls also on the monitoring center where, you know, I, I do a lot of work with my clients where we sit down and we look at different monitoring centers around the country. And some, a lot of them, the very first question that the monitoring center will ask is, let me see your insurance. Let me see your license. Let me, you know, talk to me about your experience before they want to take your accounts because they recognize the risk. And then there are some others who, as long as your check clears, will take your accounts. I believe any reputable central or or supervising station will check for licenses. Uh, there's a risk to them in being shut off in a certain jurisdiction or multiple mm -hmm. jurisdictions. And if something does happen with them in the local jurisdiction, that has a cascading effect. You have to report that on some of your renewal applications. Have you ever been, you know, cited by another jurisdiction? And once that happens it's a domino effect and they could have problems. So I think the reputable ones do a great job in making sure that whoever taken on as dealers uh, are licensed in their area. They can't control what that dealer does after that, but they do make sure that they have a license. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on when a licensed company has an opportunity in an area where they're not licensed? Does that, does it make sense to subcontract to just pass on the opportunity you know, I, I've, let's let's ignore the possibility of just rushing out and getting a license. But you know, how are your thought? What are your thoughts on on basically renting a license holder? Renting a license holder is, in most cases, the way you term it. It's it, it's not proper. It's illegal. Uh, there are companies that will hire individuals to work. They pay them as a W two. And they allow, and that's that's legal. They're working for the company, but that individual needs to have some sort of responsibility, some sort mm -hmm. of, um, you know, tie into the company. It just can't be sitting on the beach, you know, drinking uh, mai tai and getting paid every month <laughs> for having the license. They that's have to be involved common. in the business. It's very common. Now, in 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 Florida, uh, if you get caught, and there is a law that says you, allowing someone else to use your certificate is a first degree misdemeanor. So you have to be caught. The problem is you have to be caught. Mm -hmm. And there, I can I can tell you many companies and and give you a list, but I won't on here of those <laughs> that are working within Florida illegally. And they said, I'll never get a license. They can't catch me. I'm out of state. And it is very true. Unless you get a consumer complaint. Unless there is some other way, they just get by it. And that'll happen until uh, they get called to court and their contract and their insurance company, it's thrown out because in Florida, if you have a contract with an unlicensed company, that contract is null and void. So you're on your own at that point. And probably your insurance company doesn't say, oh, you aren't mm -hmm. licensed. No, no, we're not insuring you either. What about on the other side where you, so that's, that's basically renting a qualifier. What about on the other side where you sub out to a licensed company? Do you have any, I mean, I know there are some areas of the country where you can't, you just flat out can't do that, but do you think that's a reasonable business practice? If you have a customer, if you have a customer asking you to do work in an area where you can't, do you think it makes more sense? I mean, look, we know there are a lot of companies that are just going to say, like you said, try and catch me and they'll just do it. But how do you feel about just saying, OK, I found this local company. They have a license. I, I believe they know what they're doing. I'm just going to pay them to do the work for me. Is, it, is there anything wrong with that? So, again, I hate to continue to say Florida, but I know that law really well. And if somebody was to call me and say in Florida, hey, can you do this job in Orlando? And I'd say, yeah, I can do it. I do the job. I get paid for the job. And then they're getting the monitoring and they're in privy with the company or the customer, then they need to be licensed. The Florida law says if you're getting paid by the customer, you need to have a license. So again, there are ways around it. Not every law in every state is written that way. So you can subcontract from one state to another in order to pull that permit. In most cases, you need a permit in commercial applications, not so much residential, <laughs> but 
you need to show a license. So I want to kind of pivot a little bit. So you spend a lot of your time teaching. How do you think the landscape have changed? Uh, the landscape has changed in a post-COVID world, where you know I think about 2019 and before. It was a very different world of you know you'd go to a class you you you'd hope that you could get all your CEUs in time you'd go and sit and listen to you know someone like a John Drucker or a Bob Furman up here in the Northeast, and now with everything virtual it's become oh, there's a lot of on demand there's a lot of pre recorded sessions. You know, how do you feel the world has changed? Do you think it's better, worse, more convenient? What are your thoughts on that? There are those that are absolutely a better learner in a classroom than online. And there are those that do well in a virtual environment. Uh, just this past Saturday, I did a private class for 11 people uh, for a company virtually. Um, and we did it in a way where they were in a conference room and everybody's could talk and there was a dialogue, the ones where you have the webinars and you're just sitting there and everybody's muted for the hour or two hours or so, mm -hmm. and there's no interaction. I don't particularly like those, but there's also a lot of online training. And I do a lot of my courses are online through my website, staysafe.net. I've got courses approved in 13 different states, whether it be classroom, virtual, strictly online, or even now correspondence courses. Individuals learn differently. Uh, there are people in, in high school with a 2.0 grade point average. They don't really excel there, but they go into a field and they can excel. And I know an individual who uh, started out that way and has risen in the ranks from a firefighter to a paramedic, to a lieutenant, to a captain and working on chief. Uh, you find something you like, you'll embrace it. Those that come into here as a job and just go job hopping and don't see it as a career uh, will learn differently or not learn at all. Those that want to excel will do so. And some of them are at their own pace, maybe a little slower, a little faster than others. Do you like having the virtual option? I think in today's world, uh, just like we're doing this virtually today, it is an absolute given. People don't want to travel. Nobody wants to sit on an airplane with the guy behind them coughing and sneezing on them. Whether COVID is gone or not, it's still in the back of everybody's mind. I think that being in your own place, your own conference room, your own house, your own building uh, is, is much more conducive. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's the wave of the future. I also think, I mean, like you said, not, uh, you know, I'm going to say not every educator is equal because I did a training, a certification course last week where I was ready to climb up to the roof and jump off <laughs> because they had, it was a, uh, it was in a PowerPoint format where the instructor just read every single word on the page for hours. And I was, it was one of the worst, one of the worst classes I've ever taken. But then you get others where, you know, it's more engaging, it's more interesting, you go over real life scenarios, and you can apply that to the work you're going to be doing. And I think about, like, I know a couple of years ago, I remember, I'm sure, you know, Bob Shermount, who's up here in New Jersey, but when he started offering some of his classes online, it was great because you no longer had to take a day off of work to go and spend all day in a classroom. Now you could, you know, maybe you have a long commute home, you're sitting on the bus or on the train and you just pull out an iPad or your computer and you just start watching the recordings or, you know, maybe you log in virtually in the evening and pay. It's, I, thought, I think it's a great option. Depending upon the quality of the instructor, the quality of the course, how long it runs, uh, there are some states like Maine, you have to be online 15 hours, other cool. states 16 hours. That's a long time. Now you can stop and start and go back to it anytime you want, but that's a lot of training hours. Mm -hmm. New Jersey is, is 36 hours. So it, it's a lot of time that you have to spend doing classes. Florida, it's uh, 14 initial, seven renewal. Um, I think the the ones where you can do in two and three or four hour bursts, are much better than having somebody trying to sit in a class for two or three days, uh, losing interest, falling mm -hmm. asleep. And of course, when you do that, you're also taking time away from the field and that's in the back of people's minds as well. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, you know, I, I think about, I kind of circling back a little bit, you know, I think about one of the classes that I took back when I first started pursuing my, my first license, which was uh, the instructor said, when you're in the real world, you can pull out a code book. You can look up the answers. There's no, I, I don't need to teach you how to remember everything. I'm going to teach you how to navigate and understand and apply what apply this to your work. Why do some why do some states have you know closed book exams where they do expect you to remember every single you know how many inches from the wall and how many you know uh, in the real world you don't have to remember all this. Why is this why is this a requirement in some places? I think it goes back to regular schooling where you sit for the SATs or you sit for your final exams. And that's how it was done back then mm -hmm. in, in school. And I think those that have moved into the uh, licensing world, as far as from a government standpoint, that's how they see it being done. Mm -hmm. uh, others, exactly like you said, you've got all the resources. I've got 30, 40 books on my shelf right here uh, going back to 1987 code book. Uh, because it's it's a wealth of information. And at any time you can go, you can look it up, have it in your truck, you keep the latest one in your truck and you can refer to it. Or if you meet with an AHJ, uh, say, mm -hmm. hey, I did it this way because the book said, but you you know, show me what you want and have a dialogue with them. It's always best to have a dialogue and not be uh, antagonistic towards them. Uh, and and you, it works out much better. Yeah, I can't imagine having to operate in a world where you had to say, okay, wait, let's see if I'm going to do this, then I have to do that and, and have to try to remember every single minute detail of the code in real life. If you don't know the answer, you can pull out the book and say, all right, let's see this chapter. Okay. Let me call the fire marshal. Let me just confirm this. So I think I appreciate, I appreciate the jurisdictions that are more realistic about what it's going to be like after you get the license. When I did my New York City fire exam, I had to go down to Brooklyn and take the exam. And other than it was a nightmare with the paperwork and having to go to all these people at the different windows. When I actually took the exam, the exam was 30 questions and they gave you like two hours to do the exam. OK, that's reasonable. On the other hand, when I took my uh, Texas burglar alarm exam, it was 144 questions and in two hours. That was too many questions in too short a period of time. And a lot of people fail those exams because they just don't have enough time to go through it. Um, so either you're rushing through and guessing on things, and that's not a true test of your ability to pass the exam or having your experience and the knowledge. Uh, every state is slightly different mm -hmm. and uh, every test is slightly different based on the ones that issue the test, whether it's PSI, Prometric, Pearson View, or whether it's done in-house by the jurisdiction themselves. So I have a few questions that I like to ask. We're almost out of time, but I have a few questions I like to ask everybody. I'd love to have your thoughts on this. How, how would you define the term trunk slammer? Um, in 1973, I guess I was a trunk slammer. <laughs> I think the term trunk slammer is used uh, in negative terms for almost anybody that an alarm company of any stature doesn't like. Uh, I will tell you that there are trunk slammers in Florida because they work out of the trunk of their car or a single van. They have two or 300 customers. They are licensed. They are trained. Uh, but because they're a one man or a two man company, uh, they're considered trunk slammers, that they're not professional. And I can tell you that some of them are more professional than some of the big companies that are out there. <laughs> I think uh, a lot of people have this mindset that a trunk slammer is anybody that's not me. <laughs> like you said, it's a derogatory term. I think if you don't have a license, you would be considered a trunk slammer. Uh, that, that would be the difference mm -hmm. in, in my opinion. So how, what do you think, if you look at five to 10 years ago, how do you think the industry has changed? What do you think are the most significant differences? Well, obviously, the communication methods in the industry has changed. Uh, the code uh, introduced in, in 2010, uh, the idea of uh, managed facilities-based voice networks, um, and it has evolved in the last several cycles, uh, changing and keeping up with the technologies that are out there. 
Of course, the, the NFPA 72 code is written every three years, so it's always behind a little bit. Um, but the way it's written today, it's allowing for new technologies that might pop up tomorrow to be accepted by the AHJ. That is the biggest one as far as in the, in the last few years. The second big one is the conversion from wired to wireless systems. And when you go from the wired system that has to be done really by a professional uh, to the wireless and it, now you've got the DIYs, that's another big change in our industry. Yeah, I think, and I use that as my example as well. I think 10 years ago, you would never you would never use wireless systems in a commercial application. You just wouldn't do it. And today, people don't want you putting holes in their walls. They don't want you running cable. They don't want you, you know, disrupting their their store to run cable. And it's the wireless technology has evolved so much that is changing a battery really that much of an inconvenience. So I think I agree with you there. So what do you think will be the biggest change in the next five to 10 years in the industry? I don't know whether it will be a change, but what I would like to see is a national exam. Uh, I can tell you that I take these exams uh, throughout the country. And most recently, I took one just a few months ago. And I have to take another one for another jurisdiction that I have to take. Even though I've got licenses, uh, these exams are all the same. They come out of NFPA 70, NFPA 72, maybe the life safety code, um, but they're all the same. And if you pass one, why can't you use that mm -hmm. as a, a way of getting your license elsewhere? Um, Do you think I that's think realistic that, that there would be just a national certification? I think there's a move and has been a move to try and do that. Uh, what's holding it back is obviously the finances. And I will tell you that if if the law was written in such a way that there was a single exam recognized nationally, but then you, you'd have to pay everybody in their states for mm -hmm. getting the license because you passed the exam, it would be a welcome change. But I think that's still very far off in the future um, because states look at themselves as independent and not mm -hmm. considering what goes on in another state. And I will tell you that New York City <laughs> You know, fire rules in New York City are are so different than the fire rules that would be in Nassau County, just 20 miles away, mm -hmm. still part of New York State. Well, you're right. I mean, you'd have, you know, you'd see, you'd have, you know, Tennessee would say Texas or Oklahoma, had, you know, they're following a different year of the code or they have different, you know, feelings on whether you need licensing for running data cable versus fire cable. And I think I think there'd be a lot of butting heads as to, well, I don't want to lower my standard or, you know, maybe a state like we brought up before. I don't want to, you know, I don't care about these things. Why are you telling me I have to enforce this? I think, I think it's a great idea, but I think you're, I think it's going to be a lot of pushback. In Florida, there's an exam for an alarm company or anybody doing anything that's low voltage. And one is for anybody doing high voltage and electrician mm -hmm. in Tennessee and Oklahoma uh, and several other states, you have multiple exams. So mm -hmm. once you got to sit for burglar, then you got to sit for fire, then telecommunications, and then monitoring. So some states break it up, and you have to take five different exams to do the five different disciplines, even though it's still all related to one. It becomes very cumbersome, and it's hard to navigate uh, everything through the throughout the country. Yeah, I think it. If it's, and I don't know if it's a, it's a. Uh you know, being too optimistic, but I would love to see a national certification because it would make all of our lives so much easier. <laughs> you have something in that re regard with NYSET, NYSET fire alarms. Mm -hmm. uh, it's recognized nationally in, in a lot of locations. Um, so I think as we evolve and things change a little bit, you might see more movement towards a national exam mm -hmm. and national uh, certification. Well, we can hope so. Well, Roy, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to thank you very much for joining us today. How can how can people find you? How can people learn more about your business? Uh, my business is www.staysafe.net. Uh, and all of our training courses are up there in 13 different states. We have everything from a one-hour false alarm class to a 16-hour certification class. Um, and everything in between. We have electrical courses, low voltage courses, 
uh, communications courses. We run the whole gambit and new courses are always coming up and being posted online uh, on a regular basis. Thank you very much. And I'll post links to Roy's site in the show notes. And everyone, you know me, Emerson Life Safety, we work with your company to pivot and grow and scale. We'll help you with vendor evaluations. We'll help you with credentialing. We'll help you with picking out your, your help you with training. So thank you very much for joining us today, Roy, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. You're welcome.